Thank you, Pastor Jerry. Open with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Titus. We're going to do chapter 2 and 3, a little bit of teaching today. I want to share with you on a topic of how to make the gospel attractive. And I'm taking it from Titus chapter 2, the very end of verse 10. It's talking about servants and things, and it says, they need to do this to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. That word adorn means to put in order, to arrange, to make ornamental, to decorate, or to garnish. And we are told that we are to make the gospel attractive. We are to adorn the gospel, and how do we do it? So that's what I want to share with you today. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, it was interesting Last two weeks ago, I was in Nigeria three weeks ago, and on May 15th, I celebrated my 40th year of missions in Africa, and I happened to celebrate it in Africa, which is cool. So, you know, Jacob, my son that many of you know, he's now, he says he was a drug missionary. In other words, his mom and dad drug him to the mission field. (laughs) He didn't have any say in it, but he's been there now for 40 years uh, in Kenya. Great young man, love what he's doing and his partnership with GoTo Nations. But I work with a group called Surge, and we are a church planting movement starting churches around the world since the year 20. No, 2001 when we started, uh, till today we've planted somewhere around 40,000 churches worldwide. Uh, Two years ago we had the goal of planting a church a day, and then the Lord challenged us to plant a church an hour. Last year we started that goal and we got to a church about every eight hours. Right now we're at a church about every five hours. And we believe by the end of the year, we're going to hit a church an hour. Then our next goal is a church a minute. And then after that, we believe God's going to help us plan a million churches a year. And we do it by training leaders and starting indigenous, self-replicating, spirit-filled churches around the world. So what I'm sharing with you today is not just head knowledge or theory, this is something I've been living for the last 40 years. How to make the gospel attractive. And these are things that I have based my life on. The first one is from Titus 2, 1 through 8. To save time, I won't read all of the scriptures. But it's because of our character. We make the gospel attractive through our character And it talks about four groups of people. First, it talks about leaders in 2.1. It says, but for you, he's talking here to Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. What we preach must be here. We don't preach church doctrine. We don't preach tradition. We preach the word of God. You know, there's a, Bumper sticker, an old saying, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, that's not really true. God said it, and that settles it, whether I believe it or not. Okay? See, what you believe doesn't matter unless what you believe is the truth. When I was eight years old, I believed I was Superman. And I believed with all my heart I could fly. So I got a cape and climbed up to the top of the roof of our house. Now, I lived in an old southern plantation house, sat about this high off the 
ground on piers, two-story. It was a long way from the edge of the roof to the ground. I got to the top, tin roof, got down and pushed off and started sliding down the roof. Brother Jerry, I believed when I got to the bottom, I was going to jump and up, up, and away. Well, guess what? My heart felt 100% belief that I could fly met the truth of gravity. (laughs) And I realized it didn't matter what I believed. If what I believed was a lie, it was going to let me down. So when you preach, it must be based on the truth of God's word. See, my job as a minister is not to make you feel happy, even though that is the prevailing concept in many churches today. I'm not to make you feel happy, comfortable, or good about yourself. My job as a minister is to kill you. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So my job is to bring the word of God to where we die to self and live to Christ. So our character is a leader. Then it talks about old men, old women, young women, and young men. So that covers everybody. I'm probably, I don't know, maybe one of the oldest in the room. And that's okay. I just made another 15-year commitment to missions on my 69th birthday. And so I believe, like the brother you talked about earlier, in my 90s, I'm going to be traveling the world preaching the gospel, brother. I don't retire till I walk the streets of gold. And then it just begins. Amen. So it talks about the character And I'm not going to read it all, but old men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith and love, and in perseverance. And then it talks about the older women. Be reverent in their behavior, not gossips, not given to wine and teaching what is good. Young women are encouraged to love their husbands, love their children, be sensible, pure, Workers at home, kind, being subject to their husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. And then young men are to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deed with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech. So we make the gospel attractive by our lifestyle. I can't remember who it was that made this statement. Be a witness and use words if you have to. But many times you and I and many Christians, we negate the words we speak by the life we live. I remember I started the ministry when I was... Uh, still in Bible college back in 77 and the first thing I did was taught three-year-olds in children's church and we used to sing this little song walk the walk and talk the talk so let your talk and your walk be one by our lifestyle the second thing in Timothy 2 9 and 10 is we make the gospel attractive by our work habits. It says, urge bond slaves, and if Paul was writing that today, he would say employees. Urge employees to be subject to their bosses in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. I heard a message by Pastor Kevin Jones on this topic, and I've got a quote from him. He says, when you go to work each day, you should labor as if you are laboring to the Lord. You don't come here because you work for go-to nations. 
You come here because you work for God. And so you need to work like he is your boss because in reality, he is. Your faithful obedience may help you lead others in the workplace to the Lord. I hope that doesn't apply here. (laughs) But you never know. I remember one of the first missions or pastor's conferences I ever did with Pastor Larry Stockstill at Bethany World Prayer Center. We had probably three or 400 pastors in this meeting, and his first message was a salvation message. And I'm sitting back going, Pastor Larry, you are wasting our time. Why did we come all the way here to do a pastor's conference and you're doing a salvation message? And then I was surprised when about 35 of them came forward to give their hearts to the Lord. So never take it for granted. Always make sure your work habits, your lifestyle is to help you be a witness to others. And this is a statement he made that really caught my attention. He said, people today, even Christians, have an entitlement mindset. Let me read that again. People today, even Christians, have an entitlement mindset. They are insubordinate, lazy, and rude. But according to God's word, we can bring honor and glory to our Father when we submit to those in authority. These truths have not changed, and they still need to be taught today. As an employee, I give a full day's work for a day's pay. I had a young lady that worked for me in Kenya one time, and she didn't show up for work for a week. And when she finally came back, I said, Mary, where have you been? She said, oh, my church had a choir trip, and one of the members dropped out, so they asked me to go, so I just went. I said, but Mary, you've got a job. She said, yeah, but this is a ministry, so I was doing ministry, so it's the same thing. I said, well, I'm going to dock your pay a week. She said, oh, but I was ministering. I said, well, you ministered for them. Let them pay you for that week. See, she thought that she didn't have to show up for work because she was doing ministry, but she wanted to get paid for it. Be honest. I had a pastor in Kenya one time. I was teaching something like this, and I said, make sure if you're writing a personal letter, it's not on company time using a company's letterhead and a company's envelope and a company stamp. And he came to me, he said, brother, he said, before you taught that, My secretary worked for a big company in Nairobi and she did all of our church correspondence at work using their computer and their paper and their envelopes and their stamps. And he said, I had to repent and I went and asked the boss, I said, how much do I owe you for all of this that my secretary has done on your money rather than the church paying for it? Our work habits need to make the gospel attractive. So we are light and salt. Our lifestyle, Titus 2, 11 to 15. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now listen to what grace does. Grace instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. When our lifestyle lines up with God's word, we are walking in his grace. See, grace does not mean I get to do anything I want to and God's grace covers me. No, grace means God gives me the ability to do what he has called me to do. We have 
today a teaching, I think, in the church, what we could call greasy grace. Just do whatever you want and ask God for forgiveness and his grace covers everything. Well, when I read scripture, that's a slippery slope. Because God's grace teaches us to live a godly lifestyle. We do this because it says we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of Jesus. See, I plan like Jesus is not coming back in my lifetime. I've got plans of countries I want to visit. I've been in 60. My goal is to hit 100. You say, oh, that sounds like a great goal. Well, let me tell you why I have that goal. In 1988, I was in the Amsterdam airport, and there was a man at the counter in front of me with his cat. And he gave his cat's passport to the agent. I didn't know cats had passports, brother. And he got his cat's passport stamped. That was the 100th country that cat had been in. I said, God, if this cat can go to 100 countries, I can go to 100 countries. And I started working on it, okay? So I've been to 60 now, so you pray for me. I've got 40 more to go because I want to be as good as a cat. <laughs> Amen. Oh. We are to be zealous for good works. 2.14. That's why our lifestyle makes the gospel attractive because we are zealous for good works. Always looking for what is better. And then we exhort and we rebuke with all authority. So we have our character our work habits, our lifestyle, and then lastly, our relationships. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Verse 1 says, submit to all authority. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, and to be ready for every good deed. So we must obey God above all other things. You remember when they were told, do not preach the gospel anymore? Peter said, we must obey God above all things. You have that throughout the New Testament. Be subject to the authority, but be willing to be obedient to the word of God if it comes against what the authority says, but be willing to suffer the consequence. We had our um, leaders meeting not long ago, a retreat for all of our apostolic overseers, our missionaries with Surge, and sitting around the table we were talking about, well, what's ever, well, you know, I've got, been deported a couple times, been chased out of villages with machetes and axes. And one guy said, well, the third time I was kidnapped at gunpoint and started telling the story. Well, we were there to preach the gospel. And you preach the gospel regardless of whether people want to hear it or not. And I remember when I was chased out of that village of Mtongawanda, on Pate Island, Brother Jerry, before I went to Kenya, I would preach all over the United States raising funds. I'm ready to give my life for Jesus. That preaches real good in a pulpit in America. <laughs> but when you're standing in a village and 30 angry villagers come at you with machetes to kill you, the first scripture that popped in my mind, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. So I jumped on my Honda, and as I was racing out of town, I was shaking the dust off my feet. And then I got back to my campsite, 
and I had to repent of all of those fancy words I said in the pulpit because when it faced with reality, I realized I didn't really believe that. That was one of those sliding down the roof, up, up, and away, and I can fly. Amen? Come on now. We say some fancy things sometimes in the safety of our churches and our pulpits in America, but when it hits reality, is what is our relationship first with Jesus? And then what is our relationship with the authorities over us, our overseers, our pastors, our leaders? And then what is our relationship with the governments where God sends us? My wife and I one time went to Central African Republic and we got on the plane in Paris and we realized there's almost no one on this plane. So I asked the stewardess, why, why is this flight so empty? She said, oh, this is the evacuation flight. I said, evacuation flight for what? She says, yeah, we're going to evacuate all the foreigners out of Central African Republic because of the, the, the problems that are happening. So my wife and I fly in, get off the plane, they fill it up with all the foreigners. The airport was packed and they left. So we went and we had our leadership conference, did everything we were supposed to. And because we were the only thing happening, the government carried our conference live on television and radio at no cost. We had over three quarters of parliament in our meeting. And they said, why are you here? Aren't you afraid? And I said, no, this is the safest place for me on earth because God told me to be here. Even if I die here, it's still the safest place on earth because I'm in the middle of God's will. Our relationship, submit to authority. Be peaceful, gentle, and humble. We walk in peace, we walk in humility, and we walk in gentleness. That doesn't mean we, we're wimps, that we just let people walk over us. But it means that in every situation, we show consideration for all men. Because I've learned that there is not one human on this planet that is my enemy. It's the spirit that they serve that is my enemy. My job is to win everyone to Jesus, not those that like me. Amen? Pray for your enemies. Do good to those that despitefully use you. See, we don't preach that enough. Jesus hanging on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Stephen being stoned, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. See, we do not despise sinners because we was one. <laughs> That's good South Louisiana English, okay? Let me ask you, how many of you are saved? You know, you know, you know you're saved, okay? How many of you have committed a sin since you were saved? How many of you have committed a sin in 2024? <laughs> How many of you committed a sin in June? <laughs> How many of you committed a sin today? No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how often do we look down on sinners? Oh, I'm better than them. We're like the... The Pharisee, oh God, I'm glad I'm not like, oh God, look what I do. Oh God, I've preached in 60 countries. Oh God, I've led 100,000 people to Jesus. Oh God, I've planted 10,000 churches. Well, pride goes before the fall. Our relationships 
with God, with authority, and with one another. I must walk in peace, humility, and gentleness with my brothers and sisters in the Lord to make the gospel attractive. Now, I would imagine most of us this morning at some time after you woke up before you came here looked in a mirror. Make sure everything's in place. Put all the pieces back to, you know, the older you get, the more you have to do to get ready for the day, okay? <laughs> and that's the way we need to every day look in the mirror of Scripture and to see, am I attractive in my relationships, my lifestyle, my work habits, and all of these things. When people look at me, what do they see? As Brother Jerry, I learned, every person I encounter every day, because they had an encounter with me, it either draws them closer to Jesus or it pushes them farther away from Jesus because of the way I treated them and the way I acted. Make the gospel attractive. Doesn't matter your beliefs, your doctrines. And here's the kicker. Paul gave this admonition. Follow me as I follow Christ. Can you guarantee if one of your disciples reads the, reads the word like you do, prays like you do, evangelizes like you do, handles money like you do, lives like you do, that you can guarantee them heaven? That's what Paul was saying. He says, if you live just like I do, you'll make it. I have to be honest, Brother Jerry. Sometimes I fall down, fall short in that situation. Because every now and then I want to be like the sons of thunder and I want to call down fire from heaven on people. Now I know that's just me. Y'all are all holy and you never have thoughts like that. When that person pulls out in front of you on the interstate and cuts you off, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You want to know what's in your heart? What comes out of your mouth when somebody does that to you? <laughs> Amen. Make the gospel attractive.